very exciting this you know it's very exciting I, I actually I'm getting to the point we are at Studio Life episode 11 now Sean it's insane isn't it yeah. and I actually enjoy these longer format shows I do uh, more oh yes then I enjoy well not that I don't enjoy the is it shits but uh, but I do enjoy these long more long form sort of chats for those yeah. that can be bothered to listen <laughs> so welcome uh, one and all to Studio Life episode 11 um, and we're going to start with we're going to start with as always some news um, so first of all let's talk about courses there are lots of online courses in mixing mm -hmm. recording production all that kind of stuff um, we are working on a course as we speak. It's going to be a 10 part course, which you will be able to uh, download as 10 videos. And it's all being filmed here. And it's the mixing of a track. And we're really going to town. We've got Jonathan Atkinson to play drums on this. So there's a whole lot of live drum stems to mix. There's bass. Which, actually, there's which sound mega. I've mega. Got, yeah. Really cool. Um, but yeah, you know, all the things you need to do, everything needs gating and it needs compressing and EQing and everything else. So it's going to be everything from like episode one is probably just going to be drums and then there's bass and there's synths, there's guitars, there's backing vocals, there's lead vocals. There is a bit of everything. And if you're more into electronic production, it encompasses that too. There's electronic bits to this, big chunks of it. So if you're more into mixing 808s or whatever, this is going to cover you too. It's going to cover everything in one song. Everyone will be able to download the stems for themselves so they can follow along with similar or the same plugins or whatever you want to do. But I'm hoping this is going to be a really good value course for everyone and they're really going to get something out of it. You're going to get to see how engineers like Sean work with the sort of plugins that, that we review. Yeah. Uh, and we run these Is It Shit shows uh, for it's a shit show. It's a shit show. <laughs> For engineers like us. And yeah. this is a fantastic opportunity to see how somebody like Sean operates, how they use the channel strips and the equalizers, how they route their audio, uh, you know, the, the dynamic processing and the effects that they use to, to pull together mixes like the ones that you hear. Uh, it's a That's fantastic opportunity, yeah. And then the second course in the series, which will follow relatively soon after it is going to be run by this man here dan peters remix extraordinaire has remixed a lot of cool oh no you'd never guess it would you he's remixed a lot of cool stuff he's been a ghost producer for a lot of big djs he's done loads of that kind of stuff he's always the first person i call if i need a remix he's going to take that same track and show you how he will remix it what parts he will keep what parts he won't so we're going to approach it from the more electronic side of things. Yeah. Uh, we'll be looking at time stretching, ensuring that all of your samples are in time, right through to selecting kick drums, how to make those really cool side chains work, uh, how to EQ things to fit together, which elements to pick for your remix. Um, yeah, so uh, lots of interesting things yeah. to, uh, so to look at. Coming soon. Watch this space. Yeah. Uh, second bit of news, uh, I, I've got to talk about this book. So it was my birthday last week, and uh, Johnny 28. Atkinson, the drummer, 28? Yeah. Who, who believed it? Who no, one. Believe, no, no one believes it. I, no. I, I could be 28 twice. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's still too young. I? No, I couldn't. No, you couldn't. No, no. <laughs> Not quite. Close. Anyway. Yeah. Um, my good friend Johnny Atkinson, the drummer, uh, bought me uh, a fantastic book. Uh, by Bruce Swedine, Swedien. We, we don't well, know how it's pronounced. Yeah. He's, but Make Mine Music. It's this. I mean, I, I, he, he quite often buys me a book for my birthday and I sort of sat on the sofa. I, I was waiting for someone and I thought I'll just have a flick through and, and I kind of read a big chunk of it because it, it's absolutely invaluable stuff. So this guy is the guy that recorded Michael Jackson's Thriller album. Mm. But he also started his career as the protege to Bill Putnam. Bill Putnam was kind of like the first proper sound engineer. He invented the 1176. It was his idea. We need a box that keeps the vocal <laughs> at the same level in a mix. 1176 is what he came up with. Um, but this is also the guy that, he. I mean, I'm going to have to put my bins on because I can't see. But so some of the artists he has worked with, I mean, starting from the 50s, uh, got a 
Dean at Washington, Duke Ellington, The Four Seasons, Santana. Uh, he works with Jennifer Lopez, Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson. He's won five Grammys, 10 Grammy certificates, two ASCAP Composer Awards. In 1991, he was honored by the Mix Foundation for Excellence in Audio and inducted into the Tech Hall of Fame. This guy is like a legend. How the fuck did Jennifer Lopez get into that list? Don't know how Jennifer Lopez got into that list, <laughs> but she did. <laughs> she did. And it's interesting uh, because there are sort of these odd video recordings if you're a youtube rabbit holer uh as some of us are oh yeah you 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 find uh, videos of people in recording studios and when you watch the michael jackson sessions yeah there's this old bloke with a big white mustache this is him sat at the mixing desk yeah. and you're thinking what's this bloke doing there and, but, and and this is this is the guy i love the fact that there's the 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 channel list you know the track list for for his recordings all the ones in in this book and the first one is from i think it's 1958 or 1956 even it's a three track a half inch tape machine track one band stereo left <laughs> track two joe williams vocal track three band stereo right that was it record the band live that's my kind of recording that and is. then stick the vocal the down the middle and you can keep recording the vocal till you're happy <laughs> I mean that's amazing. <laughs> I mean that's that's like my four track days. We start yeah. out on four track tape. But yeah. the other one that they show you in its entirety is the actual um, channel list for Thriller, Michael Jackson. Door opening. I mean footsteps. Tracks one Wolf and two. Howls. Door opening. Track three and four. Wind. Track <laughs> four and five. Thunder. <laughs> track seven and eight. Door effects. Track nine and ten. Footsteps. Uh, Track 11 and 12, Door Moving. 13 and 14, Wolf Howls. Track 15 and 16, Synthesizer Wind. Westlake Studios. Westlake Studios. Wolf Howling again. Percussion on 18 and 19. Bass and Drums, 21, 22. Sympty on 23 and 24. So I presume they had two 24 tracks synced. Yeah. So this was all the effects and stuff, and then the other one would have been the rest of the band mm. and the vocals and stuff. I mean, it's, it's an incredible book. Uh, and there's like a couple of pages dedicated to what kind of mics you should use for what kind of vocal there's also pages you know what what preamps you use i mean he's a big 1073 guy but he talks about mics preamps compressors eqs and the the basic um science behind recording you know and, and acoustic treat everything yeah legend and it's you gotta love a book you gotta love a you book. know youtube's all good but amazon got make, to, make mine music gotta love a book yeah, go, go and get it, people. Go and get it. That's the end of the news, which must mean it's time for plug-in news. Plug-in news, which means one of our, I think, I don't know, becoming famous, one of our top fives. People love a top five. But do you know what it is this week? He's sneaking a look. The top five <laughs> this week is drum bus plugins. Now, I don't necessarily mean compressors, but any plugin that you can use on your drum bus. And for those that don't have a bus for their drums, try it. Mix your drums all into a stereo bus, which is then routed to your stereo bus. So we're going to go in five. In at number five is the TB Pro Audio GSAT. Plus, this is a saturation plugin that lets you do all kinds of different saturations, second order harmonics, third order harmonics. But it, the main thing I like about it is that it lets you add saturation to just the sides if you want. And that really makes a drum bus come alive. And the great thing about it is that it was made in cooperation with Gearspace and it's completely free. Fr free? free? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In four. In at number four is the Analog Obsession Brit Presser. Yes. Which is a modelled version of the Neve 2254 comp. Uh, this thing sounds epically analog. Really beautiful sounding compressor and it's free. If you really like it, you should, you know, use the old Patreon thing and, and help him out. But yeah, awesome plugin. In... Three. Three. <laughs> It's the Marg Magnum K Comp. Um, we reviewed this not long ago. It's uh, often overlooked. Their, their EQs are famous, but their Magnum K Comp is awesome. It's two compressors. There's like a, a main compressor, and then there's a separate called the K Comp, which is like a one knob simple comp. Uh, there's also an EQ section, which has the air EQ, and there's like a sub EQ. I found using it on my drum bus, I get awesome results. Absolutely love it. 
in two. Another one we've reviewed very recently, the UAD API 2500. It's a bus compressor which has become sort of a bit synonymous with drum buses. It's so good. It's got a thrust feature which really works on drums. You have to check it out. Dan thrusting something no one wanted to see. <laughs> not not, uh, not uh, everyone or yeah. one person. <laughs> in one very special prize. <laughs> In at number one is the Kiev Complex 760. Wow. Which, again, we reviewed unexpected, not that long ago. Yeah, well, well, it was an unexpected one for me. I was not aware of the Complex by mm -hmm. ADR when we reviewed it. Um, somehow managed to bypass me in 30 years of engineering somehow. But obviously I've read up on it since. And it's the very famous, you know, John Bonham and a few others used it on their drum mix and you can see why and it's it's clever trick is that as well as a compressor it's also an expander and by getting the ratio of expander and compressor just right with the attack and release you can get this amazing groove going it's it's awesome i love it brilliant stuff we've got to say these top fives people are loving the top fives who wouldn't love a top five anyway? yeah no, top yeah 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 the, yeah the only difficult bit is is being able to keep up and keep coming up with new ideas new, new for top, top fives, fives yeah that's we, fine yeah that's as fine. long as the people keep watching we'll keep coming up with top fives well i think it's time we can redo some of the early ones again do you yeah well i think the the charts have changed now. <laughs> new things coming out all the time oh yeah what well, you could we could reshuffle well the yeah. top 10 is different every week so it is <laughs> well used to be <laughs> it did yeah <laughs> Well, yeah, whole other discussion. Whole other discussion. Okay, so that... Uh, that was plug-in news, which means it must be time for Retro Talk. Retro Talk. Right. So, Retro Talk used to be me and Dan reminiscing about gear we used to own or used to use in the studio and how, you know, we miss it, blah, blah, blah. And then we changed it up recently and at the moment we've turned it into basically Retro Talk about retro tunes. Which seems to have gone down remarkably well because People what we've done it, yeah. is we've sort of started the ball rolling, we've nudged the ball down the alley and we've asked for some requests via the comments we have. which we would encourage you to do again because Absolutely. what we are doing today is we are actually talking about the production of tunes that were that, that have been suggested yeah by people by our followers specifically in this case instagram crack on then you go Am first. I starting yeah you start well oddly enough this was uh, suggested by a uh, a member of our viewing a member of a fan, our fan base i think i think it's fair to say all five of them <laughs> yeah who spotted that i was wearing a pantera t-shirt one one day you know and uh, sean and i are slightly different there's about 10 years be between sean and i uh, he's he's a bit older than i am at 8 years i said about 10 <laughs> Um, which meant that uh, I, I, rather than growing up in the 80s, I grew up in the 90s, uh, which meant I was around in that sort of early 90s when some of the best rock and metal albums were... Well, you were around in the 90s too, but... I was around in the 70s as well, then. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, we were listening to... Uh, well, I, in fact, I, I looked this up. Uh, Metallica Black, Nirvana Nevermind, 10 by Pearl Jam, Blood Sugar Sex Magic, Use Your Illusions by Guns N' Roses and Screamadelica were all released in 1991. That's insane. All in one year? Yeah, all in one year. Some of them were released within three or four months of each other. This is a famous sort of... Uh, we don't get years rock. like that anymore. You don't get years like that anymore. Um, but off the back of some of that came, uh, well, a plethora of other bands, one of whom are my favourites, Pantera. Um, and somebody suggested, somebody had seen me wearing a Pantera T-shirt and suggested that we talked about a Pantera song, Walk. Be yourself by yourself. Stay away from me A lesson learned in life um, Which I'm hoping some of you will have heard of and will be familiar with and, and falls within the genre that became groove metal. You familiar with groove metal? I'm not familiar with groove metal. No, no. Well, there was... Uh, it was defined by, well, chunky, groovy guitar riffs. Yeah. You might, you know those clicky kick drum sounds? Yeah, yeah, You yeah. know, a, a, a snare drum that's deeper than the, the kick drum. Tell me what's a really famous groove metal song that I might know. Uh, Walk by Pantera. <laughs> that you might know. It's good to know. No. I might uh, know if I heard it. Ca Cow you would, you would. Cowboys from Hell. So anyway, uh, so this comes from Vulgar Display of Power, which was yep. actually 1992. And it was Pantera's uh, sixth studio album. Although they would consider it their second, because oddly, they were a glam band. 
Okay. Initially, some uh, in some circles they were they were known as a Kiss tribute band. Wow. Uh, the uh, the the album that was before Vulgar Display of Power, which was Cowboys from Hell, which was the one I was going to talk about before somebody suggested uh, Walk from Vulgar Display of Power, was their fifth studio album, but they considered their first. Okay. Because it was their new sound, this groove metal sound. So it's produced by a guy called Der- Terry Date, and he worked on Vulgar Display of Power and Cowboys from Hell. The interesting thing people are out there thinking Dan's waffling on about metal that none of us are interested well not none of us you're all interested in it but there's a really interesting way about how these albums were recorded and bearing in mind we were on a cusp weren't we in the 90s mm-hmm. you know we've, we talked about this in Live in La Vida Loca wasn't it, it was the first track recorded yeah, entirely in, in the box changing, you yeah. know there was a load of stuff going on but this was produced uh, Pantera produced by their drummer a guy called Vinnie Paul yep but he was also their recording engineer, mm. their mixing engineer, and their producer. Now there were other members of the of the person of technical personnel. But do you know how they recorded it? They tracked the drums first. Right. So the producer tracked his own drums first. To what? A click or something? Yeah, to okay. click. Then they would record the guitar to the drums. Okay. And then the bass player would record against the guitar without the drums. I mean, you would think there would be issues there with timing. You would. Yeah. But, but contrary to those issues that you are assuming, yep. they did it to negate those issues. So they reckon that it made the bass tighter with the guitar yep. if it wasn't, if the drums weren't included Ooh, in the mix. Okay. And then uh, there was quite a lot of editing. But if you're familiar with these albums, yep. although there's a lot of production on them, they've, obviously the drums are very produced and what have you, um, Dimebag, Daryl, the guitarist, yep. who s- sadly was, uh, he was killed on stage. Wow. Uh, shot on stage. Um, but he, not only, he was a pioneer of solid state amplification. Yep. So he's a phenomenal guitar player, very, very, uh, very much his own sound. Um, um, I forgot where I was going with that. But uh, there's no rhythm tracks over his solos on these albums. So when it comes to a guitar solo, yeah. normally you have this big sort of flare of guitar sounds or something yeah, that comes yeah, yeah. up under the guitar solo to give it a lift. With Pantera, it drops the bass and drums, and it's just, oh, just, the, the, solo. just the guitar solo. Brave. Yeah. Cool. So, um, well, I mean, to be, to be honest, that sort of brings me to the end of my, my, my skit about Pantera. Okay. But I could not... Th- those two albums specifically... Yeah. Um, Vulgar Display of Power, 92, Cowboys from Hell, uh, 1991. Go out and have a listen as an example of of overproduced groove metal. You know, uh, it started with Metallica, with um, And Justice for All, this kind of massively overproduced sound, not not really knowing where to go post-Sabbath, post, you know, all of wow. this sort of stuff. And it, and it took them, I think, to that 91 where, I mean, obviously Metallica, yep. the Black Album, that was the defining. I mean, I can remember going out working when we were touring in the, when it was, whenever it was, we went out and did those years of, of tours. And we'd arrive on these big European stages. You'd be doing front of house, nice and easy, cushy little number. I'd be doing monitors. You'd turn up, there'd be a huge... Midas XL yeah. and a load of wedges and it was known as the Lars kick drum sound yep. you know just click on the kick yeah, yeah, yeah. and it all came from this sort of uh, this sort of genre well, do you know what in my life I've spent three days working with metal bands mm. in my whole career uh, first day was um, I think I want to say mid 90s I was freelancing I got a call that an engineer had been taken ill and could I get to Great Linford Manor which back in the day was mm, a famous yeah, metal yeah. studio uh, up near Milton Keynes. Mm-hmm. And I spent a whole day recording kick drums. Yeah. And all we were doing was trying to match the two kick drums all day. Mm-hmm. Same mics, same drums. I literally couldn't hear the difference. To me, they sounded pretty damn matched from the minute we started. Literally all day moving mics. I, uh, like millimetres. I was quite big into the into the metal thing. I and I worked at what was it, it was in Derby Assembly Rooms. It was it's now massive. It was called Bloodstock. It was this. Little I remember festival. Bloodstock. Yeah, but um, it's the wooden beater on, yep. your, on your kick drum pedal, and then the two P piece. Yeah, yeah. Click, 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 click. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, wow. Uh, 
interesting stuff. Love a bit of metal. The it, other here's um, to all you metalheads out there. <laughs> well, the other day I did a studio I was working at. It might have even been before the the the, the Great Linford thing. I think it was um, I can't remember. It was somewhere in London. Anyway, I got stuck doing a day's mixing with a metal band, and the guitarist and the singer were the only two people there. And it's the first time I'd heard to the guitar referred to as the chug. Yeah. They were talking about uh, the chug. Yeah, the chug, and yeah. Like, We've got to get the chug right. Yeah. And I was like, I at that stage in my career, I think I'd only really mix sort of pop and, mm. and a bit of house. Yeah. Not really done much else, a bit of indie stuff, but it wasn't much. No, the chug, mate. And he was like, yeah, we got to get the chug. And I'm like, I think I was like 21, 22. What do you mean by the chug? He's And he was like, this bit. And I'm like, well, you know, and it had been recorded. And it sounded like that. Mm. And he was like, no, no, no. It has to be the biggest thing in the mix. Mm. And so we messed around with compression and EQ and we ended up double tracking it. Yeah. It, it did sound epic by the end, but but I remember then the next thing was like, now we've got to get the snare in. And I'm like, oh, it's, it was like such a busy It is, yes. Yep. Yep. It was crazy. The chug anyway. fills stuff up, man. It does. It does. The chug. Anyway. Right. My turn. Uh, I'm going to be a bit cheeky this week and we're going to talk about a track that, that I mixed. Oh, bit of self promotion and all then that. Then why not? Not really, mainly because I just know the story behind it, all of it, because because I did it. So um, this is a track called Candy Crush by Kim White. This was recorded in 2018 for Here Come the Aliens album. Um, it was a song that she'd written uh, a few years before. It was written by a guy called Frederick Tomander, another guy called Anders Wickstrom, along with Ricky Wilde, her brother, and Kim herself. The four of them wrote this track together. And I heard early demo versions of it um, before we decided to record it. We made a decision quite early on in the album, sort of chat, that we were going to do it with the band. You know, I think up till that point, Kim had mainly recorded everything very studio produced, you know, electronic production. Mm -hmm. You know, even if it was going to sound rocky, it would be done quite often, you know, with samples and stuff. But we decided we were going to do an album with the band. So Ricky produced the backing track stuff, got all of that, um, you know, ready. I think at that stage, he probably sent it out to Johnny Atkinson, uh, the drummer, to, to sort of learn and to listen to. Um, I'm fairly certain he sent it to Neil Jones, the guitarist. Neil would have recorded his own parts at home. He used, um, I think it was the Axe Effects back then, before we got Kemper or whatever he's got now. He would have recorded all his own parts at home, the guitarist. Um, the bass, I don't know whether that was Paul Cooper or whether that was Ricky who played that. But again, it was sort of live bass mixed with synth bass. It was, it was a whole bunch of stuff going on. Um, Ricky would have played keys on it. Uh, and then we booked Rack Studio 2 with the API console, which I've been working there on and off for over 25 years. We booked that to record all the drums. So we did the drums for Candy Crush in there. Um, yeah, just set up a monitor mix for Johnny. He knew already what he was doing. And I think, I think he nailed it in like two takes. And Johnny's really cool. He will, he will turn up having done his homework. You know, there won't be any... Makes a difference, doesn't it? Yeah, it just cracks on, boom, done. I think we got to two takes and we're like, didn't hear anything wrong with that. Mm. That was bang on. And then all it I did... It takes longer to record the drums than it does to set the drums up. Yeah, that can happen. <laughs> but I remember me and Rick were like, well, we're kind of happy. And then and then we're like, well, why don't you do one take where you just go nuts? Mm. Silly feels, bit crazy, nothing you would really do, but let's just go for it. So we did a take like that as well, which gave us some options for adding in some crazy feels and stuff later by editing them in. Um, so yeah, drums recorded at Rack, uh, vocals recorded at Rick's, uh, Rick, Ricky Wilde, the producer's studio, it's called Doghouse, his studio he's got. Uh, vocals done there, down at Neumann Fett 47. And then we took the whole thing back to Rack. It's gone now, but back then they had an SSL E-Series mix room at Studio 4, which I'd mixed an album in about five years before that and I, and I loved it. So we booked that for the mix. And we mixed the whole album there, and Candy Crush was one of the tracks we mixed there. And not completely analog style, in that I was doing sub mixes in Logic and then throwing buses out to the SSL. So there was a drum bus going through the SSL, there was a synth bus, a guitar bus, 
backing vocal bus, all the effects were running through the SSL. The vocal processing was done analog, so I used the Poltec EQP1 on Kim's vocal, I think 1176 on the vocal. Uh, and then the BVs were, were processed in the box, but then fired out to the SSL for the, you know, basically a VCA mix down through the, the mix bus compressor on the SSL and then back into the computer. So what happened was, was there was, I think 11 or 12 tracks on that album. And I think six of those SSL mixes we kept. And I think there was like five or six mm -hmm. we needed to tweak. Uh, I knew that was going to be a possibility, so I bounced everything back into the computer through the SSL. So the vocal had gone through everything, and then I'd recorded that back in. So I had everything. Um, and then I I think I probably did five or six revisions of Candy Crush mm. before we were all happy. And I ended up doing them at home. And I bought the um, IGS S-Type bus compressor for that mix. So yeah, that was quite a lengthy mix, but it was it's such a... It's such a high energy rock pop mm. thing. There's not a lot of room. You know, it's it's a very difficult to get a mix like that right. So I've got a question. Yeah, go on. So we were talking about uh you were saying Scarlet likes uh, Harry Styles. My Scarlet, yeah. yeah. yeah, and, we, yeah. and we were talking about My daughter. Uh, um the sound of the album. Yes. Uh, you know, the Harry Styles album. Yeah, yeah. Which we both know all the drums were programmed on. Yeah, yeah. You know, um I, I it had you know tom grennan i know they yep. took the whole band into the studio to record yep. his album except the drummer yeah um so what what are your thoughts now that drum program is junk drum programming is so advanced and so strong yeah what are the benefits of taking a drummer into the studio now exactly what happened on this in that he listens to it he learns it mm. he turns up he puts uh, he puts something into it that you don't get if you pro I can program drums as good as anyone mm. but they're not as good as if a drummer has played it mm. and they're never going to be they they will probably do in a lot of cases but a drummer brings something new to it do you know that's a very good point isn't it they will probably do if you've got budget yeah. restrictions no one will know yeah it won't be that kind a drummer yeah. will know yeah but because, no one else will know do you know you know, do you know and it drives me this I, it actually drives me insane program drums do you know you know cuz every snare shot sounds exactly the same as the one before it it can do. I mean, it's weird in that people were aiming for that for a long time, and now we have like like that um, the thing we looked at recently, the mindset drum, the humanized thing. Yeah. So now it's like there'll be twenty five different snare samples in it, and it won't put any two of them next to each other, so that that doesn't happen. Mm. So you can get around stuff like that. But ultimately, a drummer is a groove. It's mm. a bit like getting a guitarist. You know, a famous. If I pick up the Edge's guitar, mm. I don't sound like the Edge. No. Even if I learn well, his parts, you would because it's all. <laughs> I'm well, it doesn't get, matter I'm who it is. That. It's not getting into that Bill Bailey sketch. But whoever it is, yeah. the tone comes from your fingers yeah. and the groove comes through your arms and your hands. You're and... sounding very old-fashioned, Sean. I know, but I, you know, I work with a lot of electronic stuff, but I 100% mm. appreciate the fact that you can't put groove into a track the same way a drummer can. You know, and I like the randomness and the you know mm. non-linearity of the, it all. The randomness that drummers bring to it. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you you need to punch a drummer, but you know, generally. What's that they say? <laughs> What's the difference between a drummer and a drum machine? You only have to punch the beat into a drum machine <laughs> once. <laughs> I think that's referring to bad drummers. I've been, oh, sorry. I've yeah. been very lucky to work with good ones. Yeah. Anyway, back to the tune. Um, so yeah, we eventually got it finished. Uh, it was then sent to Tim Young at Metropolis, who in those days was mastering everything I did. Done an amazing job. Very happy with the mastery he did on that. Um, then we got asked uh, to do a radio edit. Uh, we, the label wanted to put it out as a single, and it was second single off the album. And I spoke to the radio plugger, and he suggested all these different people that could do the radio edit. And in the end, I decided to do it myself. So I, I literally just, we chopped the intro down. There was a bunch of rules still still stand these days i think the once the track starts within 15 seconds the vocal has to come in and you have to be at the first chorus in under a minute and it has to finish before three minutes i think we got it down to like 250 or something and i made a couple of other changes i made it a little bit wider um i re added um some electronic drums underneath the drums mm. just to give it a bit more oomph and i pulled the guitars down simply because i knew that the two guys who were uh, basically programming what was getting on the radio at the time were very very anti guitar band so i thought i'll just pull them down a bit who, push the, the synths up a bit who was the dude that was the mastering engineer who was doing masters that were anti 
Radio 1 compressor. I've asked you... Oh, I don't know. We've had this conversation before, haven't we? Have we? Yeah. I can't remember. No. But yeah. You do specific Radio 1 edit, Radio 1 master. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. To respond to their compression. Well, it does get absolutely crushed. So yeah. you do have to, yeah, be Ca- careful. Candy crushed. Candy crushed. Yeah, well, you know, it's kind of what we did. I didn't send it for remastering. I mastered the, the radio edit specifically for radio. Um, but it worked. We got Signal of the Week on Radio 2. Got rotated for about six weeks, I think, on national radio all over the world. So I'm well happy with that. And, uh, yeah, done me a lot of favours. Brilliant stuff. So there you go. That's the story behind Candy, Candy Crush. Crush. Um, which brings us to, Dan, probably our favourite section. Top five again. No. Oh, shit. Hot Topic. Hot Topic. It's Hot Topic. We're gonna go deep. How deep? Well, I don't know. I guess we'll just see how deep it goes. So, Sean, yes. tell us, what's this week's hot topic? Yeah. <laughs> uh, today's hot topic is all about the mixing environment and monitoring. Mm. How important is your mixing environment? And how important are monitors? Do they need to cost a fortune? Do you just need to know them really well? How much, What, in your experience, how much of those things contributed to... I'm going to start with something that happened bad. to me this week. Okay. I I um, had some friends round. They were prolific remixers and house producers in, okay. the, in the mid-90s. Dylan and Dickens, Illicit, High Estate Records, Re- Kylie, Cher, yeah, Stevie yeah, yeah. Nicks. Big, 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 big mixes. Yeah. And they fucking hate ns10s well lots of people hate ns10s <laughs> and in there they had they had speakers i don't know even know what spe- they had just speakers that they knew in their studio yeah and they turned out some of the biggest mixes even now you yep. listen to them and you think oh you know yeah. um and so and i'm a bit haphazard <laughs> when it comes to mixing ha- environment haphazard <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Um, so, I I can give credence. What I, I guess what I'm sort of driving at. Yep. There's, I give credence to quality monitors yes. and environments, and I'm sure that as mastering and you know, however, I think it comes down to knowing your speakers and knowing your environment and yes. knowing and and reference is what I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I had. Um, yeah, I had a, a start like loads of people back in the day and I had a four track in my bedroom and, you know and I did everything on headphones for quite a few years and then I plugged it into a stereo system and and then I probably went from you know that terrible setup to working immediately on NS10s in an SSL place which you don't even think about the acoustic environment in a studio like that you just assume it's good mm. you, you never check it you know and I know now people do mm. check studios and go then this is this isn't great yeah yeah you know, and i think i think we just didn't even think about it back then um i was aware that the studio i worked at second a place called psychoactive which i i helped build mm. um that had an awesome control room that, that was brilliant and the the monitors in fact it was the first time i worked on dyne audios it was what i've got now but the dyne audio m1s we had there those monitors in that control room are a lot to do with why i've got these monitors in this room uh and even so much as it's the same colour. Do you know, it, it, sorry. No, I was just going to say, it was just, I, I just remember them being not particularly nice to listen to. Mm. Quite hard to get it to sound good. But when it did, it sounded good everywhere. Yeah. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? You know, you, you can have the best studio and monitors and modelled room. Yeah. You still check your mix in your car. Yeah, yeah, still do. Yeah. You know, you still adjust the mix to how it sounds in yep. your car. The o- the other thing I'd say is that I did a I spent two years working at a studio on Brick Lane at, yep. at Essential Direct. Yep. And they'd got some, do you know, I can't even remember what they were, but bi- you know, they're, they're built in. I mean, they must they were, they must have been 15, 15 and twos. You know, uh, fif- in fact, there might have been three ways. I, c- I can't remember. But what I do remember about working there is you could have it bollocking yep. and your ears wouldn't ring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know, it was crystal. Yeah. It was just crystal 
crystal yeah, clean. Well, it's harshness rather than volume, isn't it? That, yeah, exactly. That, well, that, that's what I mean. That's the yeah. difference between quality monitoring is that, you know, the, the clean... Yeah. I always think of it as, you know, pure sine waves don't damage your ears. But if, you, if, you, yeah. if you've got, yeah. you know, that's where the... Well, that's what, you know, a lot of people don't understand that what will blow a set of um, NS10s. I mean, they were famous for blowing left, right and centre. But what the reason they used to blow... <laughs> that's only 5.1. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Sorry. The reason people used to blow NS10s all the time was because they were using underpowered amps. Yeah. If you if you use an underpowered amp and over crank it, it will start to distort. That's mm. what makes things crap out. If you use a decent, you know, 100 watt per channel amp on NS10s, they probably won't yeah. blow, so be yeah. careful. Because you're never going to be distorting them. It's uh, yeah, it's bad. It's bad noise, isn't it? That makes yeah. makes your makes your ears ring. But as far as the environment goes, so like, I, I've I've had a lot of setups at home over the years, and and I've always been aware of what the issues were. Obviously, standing waves are a problem because you can't fix them unless you can change your environment. Yeah. And things like if you get a node, you know, so a node is when you have a particular frequency that that has an issue and. It was really weird. When I first put the gear in this room, fired it all up, ran a load of sweeps to, you know, check out the frequency response of the room, there was a real issue at around 100 hertz. And, oh, God, you know, that's awkward. That's a terrible frequency to have a problem at. So the first thing you do is move the monitors. It's all you can do. I don't have loads of room for manoeuvre. I literally just moved them forward about six inches, and it went. It just went. And I'm like, that's that's mm. amazing. But yeah, it's quite... It's what they call wavelength, isn't it? Well, exactly that. Yeah, yeah it's all about the distance mm. between them and whatever's causing the issue. And then, you know, obviously when you build a studio, you've, you've got to make sure you've got no parallel surfaces. So obviously this studio has a sloping ceiling. The walls are towed in slightly. The wall tilt back slightly. There's no parallel surfaces. This is, you know, deep rock wall construction. So it's dealing with everything down to, I should think, probably... Probably down to 500 hertz is probably dealt with quite nicely. Mm. From 500 down to 80, it's 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 all right. Mm. It's good enough. But no one in a in a studio, unless you have 25 foot of space behind yeah, where you say, sit yeah. to build a 25 foot deep base trap, nobody can deal with those sort of 50 hertz, 40 hertz issues. You just can't. You haven't got the room. I mean, I've got two deep base traps here. They're only about half a meter deep though. But they they're dealing with much higher up frequencies. But yeah, anyone who says, "Oh no, I've sorted it. I've got a completely flat response in my room," you haven't. Mm. If you have, you're lucky. Yeah, and and then go and have a beer with someone that's interesting. Because uh, <laughs> Jesus, you know, I've been yeah, engineer for all these years. I'm not interested in this just that stuff. If you're churning out stuff that sounds good yeah. and your studio works for you, you know, I'll tell you something. I like I I love Yamaha monitors. Yeah. You know, the I've got uh, MSP3s, MSP5s, and NS10s uh, in my home yeah, yeah. studio. That, you know, bec well, for two reasons. One, you <laughs> they last and you know how they sound, but, you know, they're not as expensive as your Genelex and as your, yeah, yeah. you know, your, your Dyna Audios and stuff. Yeah. So there you go, Dan Peter's tip. Always go and check the Yamaha stuff out. Yeah. Well, I, I you know, that... Candy Crush truck we're talking about. I mix that on the NS10s. Mm. You know, they're not expensive anymore. You pick them up fairly cheap. Your um, your vote. That's how you balance your vocals. isn't Always it? Always flip over. On, that's pretty much yeah. Pretty much, I flip onto the NS10s when I'm putting the vocal in the mix because I've found that if I'm happy with where the vocal's sitting on the NS10s, regardless of how it sounds on anything else, mm. that's right. Mm. You know, but I think that's just because of what I'm used to hearing. But but yeah, monitoring like the the Auratone, I literally just use that for the kick drum. Mm. Nothing else. I fire it up when I'm when I'm putting the kick drum in the mix, and it's like if I can hear the click of the kick drum on the Auratone, I'm fairly happy. That's in the right ballpark. Should have mixed some nineties metal. <laughs> <I> should <laughs> click on the kick drum. I don't think I'm getting that job now. No. Well, anyway, it's not the nineties. It's not the nineties. It's not the nineties for start. That's a good point. <laughs> anyway. So there we go. But yeah, we'd be interested to hear your thoughts on acoustic environments and how important they are. You know, is it if you're a hobbyist, does it matter that much? Decent pair of headphones going to get you by? Or do you need to spend a load of money on treating a room properly or building a room? You know, whatever. Talk to us. We'll get back to you. We will. Absolutely. So I think that's it for episode 11 of Studio Life. Please check out the links below. Like the video. Subscribe to the channel. 
Yep, there. What is there? There's um, Instagram. Instagram, Shoe Life 101. There's the Patreon, all that kind of stuff. There's a merch store. Loads of stuff. It's all down there. Get involved. Send us some messages. Tell us tracks you want us to uh, look at the production of. Do that. All right. We will catch you in episode 12. Adios.